Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, first of all, a, a quick introduction to myself. I mean, uh, Craig has already um, introduced me, but very quickly, I'm uh, Vice President of Carbon Pricing and Private Sector Decarbonization, which is a, an awfully long title, at I Environmental Defense Fund. Um, I'm new to NACW, and I'd like, first of all, to congratulate NACW on 20 years. Um, this is my first NACW, but it's fortunately or unfortunately not my first carbon market event. I've been working on carbon markets for pretty much as long as NACWs have been around um, in various uh, capacities. Um, this is going to be a, a, a sort of a conversation between old friends uh, in some cases, very much uh, uh, people that we uh, that we keep in touch on, on almost a, a, a weekly basis. Um, so, together with me on stage is uh, Alexia Kelly. Alexia and I have uh, met on and off uh, several times over 20 years as well. Um, she has been around the market for a, a long time as Offset Quality Initiative (WRI). Um, State Department for a long time. We, we clashed in, in international climate negotiations when I was EU negotiator, and she was the dark, evil side of the other uh, <laughs> the other side of the Atlantic. Um, she then uh, moved on to uh, Netflix, and just uh, congratulations, she's just uh, taken up a, a new role as director of the Carbon Markets and Policy Initiative at um, High Tide Foundation. Uh, with us on uh, on on screen, so virtually. We have uh, Owen Hewlett, um, Chief Technical Officer of the Gold Standard. Uh, Derek Brukhoff, um, again, somebody who's been in this market for a long time and a former Vice President for Policy at um, Climate Action Reserve and currently Senior Scientist for the Stockholm Environmental Institute. And uh, Kelly Kazire, who's, um, again, also, like myself, a former negotiator in the international uh, climate negotiations and um, had on several roles, including um, uh, one at EDF. She was the one that hired me at EDF. And then, um, and now she's uh, gone off, over to Bezos Earth Fund, where she leads the, uh, the climate program. So all of us are uh, good friends, but we do, hopefully, will have some kind of uh, contention around some of the issues that we uh, are going to discuss. Just as a, as a scene setter, a couple of, of sentences. Um, those of us who have been in this uh, in international arena around carbon markets have seen um, everything from the, the heights of the, the clean development mechanism uh, operating in 2010 with uh, huge uh, volumes being traded to the doldrums of 2015 and 2014. Um, a lot of uh, anticipation regarding what would come uh, out of the demise of the Kyoto Protocol and finally, we get to 2015 and we have the Paris Agreement. And thanks uh, um, in, in no small part to some of the people uh, on, on this panel, we do have a Article 6 that is the framework for uh, what we hope will be an international, vibrant uh, carbon market. But there are many different uh, uh, issues surrounding what that Article 6 actually looks like. Um, and so just to bear in mind, that even though Article 6 was uh, there in the book since 2015, as is usual in international climate negotiations, it took us a while to get to some of the detailed um, underpinnings of what Article 6 would look like. Things uh, or issues such as how does uh, one account for international transfers of uh, emissions or, or emission rights, uh, or in the, in the, the jargon of the, the United Nations Conference, um, ITMOs, International uh, Transfers of Mitigation Outcomes. Um, the other lingering questions are, what happens to the old clean development mechanism? How do we transition over to uh, the new clean development mechanism? In all of this, uh, as we were developing these rules for, for Article 6 and for international uh, transactions, uh, something happened. And uh, again, cussing my, back, uh, my, my uh, eyes back to when I was a very important person, presumably being the, the, one of the vice chairs of the Clean Development Mechanism, 
back in 2010, I wouldn't even know what Climate Action Reserve were doing because we were so arrogant in those days. We thought of the voluntary carbon market as a kind of a little minnow over there. There's, there's some stuff that is happening, but really the, the real stuff is happening within the UNFCCC. The real stuff is happening within the clean, clean development mechanism. Boy, have roles reversed because the real stuff right now is happening in the voluntary carbon market. The real stuff is happening through the work of various uh, standards. The clean development mechanism is pretty much, I would say, uh, dead and buried. Although, funnily enough, there, there is a meeting of the CDM executive board going on right now, in this week, but nobody would know, actually. Um, so you know, please rescue them from, uh, from, from where they are. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's an important thing. The voluntary carbon market has grown but where does it fit with in this larger framework of international transactions? How do we account for international transfers? And there are some very deep discussions going on, have been going on for a number of years around how do we account for those? How do we adjust? How do we uh, take into account the impact of voluntary carbon market transactions um, into the commitments that uh, nations, uh, nation states have done under Paris. Uh, so for you who know the, about these things, the all important question of should we have uh, corresponding adjustments applied to voluntary carbon market transactions. And there's a world of divide between those who uh, are for and those who are against that. Uh, I do have an opinion on that, but I will keep silent now because I am the moderator. So I'll go over to <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll first uh, uh, pitch to uh, Alexia to, given your experience, both as a negotiator, but also in the, you're the one uh, out of all of us that has actually had a, uh, a, the task of going out and procuring uh, carbon credits. Um, so tell us about your perspective or where we are going in terms of this potential convergence of voluntary and compliance markets under Article 6. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Pedro. And it, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Thanks so much for the invitation to participate. And lovely to see dear old friends uh, on the line and in the rooms over the course of the last few days. Um, as Pedro said, I'm Alexia Kelly. I'm the managing director of a new program at the Hyde to Hyde Foundation called the Carbon Policy and Markets Initiative. We are focused on building robust and strong standards to help guide the evolution of the voluntary carbon market and voluntary climate action. Uh, in order to help mobilize climate finance. So prior to joining High Tide full-time just about a month ago, uh, I was the director of Net Zero Plus Nature at Netflix where I oversaw all of our science-based target implementation as well as our global carbon credit portfolio and strategy. Um, and for my sins uh, of having worked in the UNFCCC as the lead negotiator on Article 6 um, from 2010 until about 2016 through the Paris Agreement, um, had the opportunity to really experience firsthand what it meant both to design the rules that sort of uh, architect this emerging market uh, and also to go out and buy credits in the real world uh, and really think through the implications of the policies that we're putting in place and what that means not just for buyers, but also for the folks doing the hard work on the ground, the project developers and the communities that are participating in these programs globally. Net-net, we are in a both challenging and exciting time. Um, I think if you look back at history, and I would make a friendly amendment to the title of this, which is not voluntary versus compliance, it's voluntary and compliance. Um, we truly need all tools in the toolbox. Um, I think the IPCC report uh, that was released this week illustrated just the, the severity and enormity of the challenge that we are collectively facing um, as we both hurdle towards tipping points and seek to decarbonize uh, a global economy that is entirely dependent on fossil fuels for pretty much everything that we do. And so this work of quantifying, of tracking, of um, monetizing the mitigation outcomes of uh, interventions globally is enormously important. And the work that the carbon markets broadly in both compliance and voluntary contexts have been undertaking over the course of the last two decades 
um, really, I believe, will serve as the framework for how we as a global community start to think through and operationalize the net zero economy transition. Because at the end of the day, um, the various actions that you undertake are all project level interventions by and large, which means that we need to be able to assess and quantify the impact of those interventions. We need to make sure that those interventions are in fact truly additional. Um, and we need to make sure that as we are collectively advancing towards this goal, we are able to allocate credit and benefit in the places that it needs to go to align incentives. And so the conversation around Article 6 and intersection with voluntary carbon markets and how these systems nest together and interact is still very much uh, in evolution currently, but I believe it's fundamental to affecting this transition as efficiently and effectively as we possibly can. Um, and I also think that we have a lot of the, the pieces of the puzzle in place that we need in order to really make this whole thing hang together. Um, so if you think about the way that baseline adjustments occur, um, part of that regulatory surplus requirement is taken into consideration. So as NDCs begin to be implemented by national governments and as those policies start to take effect, there should be a natural ratcheting effect that occurs in order to reflect and accommodate those. So very much looking forward to the discussion today. I think we have an enormous number of new tools available to us um, to do this work better and looking forward to digging into some of the details um, with the rest of my esteemed colleagues on the panel. Thank you, Alexia. Uh, let's move over to um, Owen. Owen, you're the, the, the standard, the one standard representative here on this panel. Um, gold standard uh, has actually, uh, um, unlike other standards, actually has a, at least some policy and, and thought reflections out in the public around issues that we are discussing, such as the availability and the, 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 the use of corresponding adjustments. So could we hear about your views on, uh, on these issues and how you see the future in terms of convergence of convergence or overlap of voluntary compliance markets? Yeah, thanks, Pedro. Hi, everyone. I mean, I think Alexia said it really well that, you know, it's, it's very much voluntary and compliance and maybe an insight from our side in terms of how we're setting ourselves up and how we think about that is, I think when we think of voluntary and compliance, I think what we're really referring to is the use case or the intended use of the credit itself. And to some extent, that's always been true. Uh, you mentioned the clean development mechanism, obviously primarily a compliance use case originally, but went on to sell into the into voluntary offsetting through its own voluntary offset um, uh, platform. And to some extent, that's true also of us at Gold Standard, where you know, we have the, the, the classical, if you like, use cases of voluntary offsetting, but we also have, you know, partnerships with the Swedish government where you can use gold standard as um, 6.2 ITMO. So various use cases emerge, Corsia, compliance use case, South Africa, a, a compliance use case where you're offsetting the state rather than the company. Lots, lots of different, you know, use cases for credits, I think, which are emerging. And for us, it's really important that we don't attempt to create a standard and an issuance type for each of those use cases, but rather try and consolidate stuff into a unit that aligns with enough of the key frameworks that you've got a chance of using that credit in as many of those use cases as possible. So as a project developer, you know, you have a thing that you can sell into whatever market you consider to be most valuable and competition can do its thing. Now, we can't align with every single one of those schemes. You know, you can't align all credits with South Africa and say you can only issue credits from South Africa. That doesn't make any sense. But there are some core alignments like uh, Article 6. Um, we've done a lot of work around Article 6. We have a practitioner's handbook on our website for that. Um, and ICVCM, which is starting to create, we hope, some of the norms and normative definitions for um, carbon credits generally. And so the way we'll approach it is core alignments of those two and then um, kind of optional in quotation alignments for things like Corsia or South Africa if you want to sell into those. And in that way, you know, we can remain at least at the system level agnostic as to whether um, uh, uh, we want compliance or voluntary use cases. And then, I mean, just in terms of, you know, which is better, I think, like, I fully agree with Alexia, I think context matters here. I think what really counts and what will really help is that countries become intentional about their use of markets, that markets don't just happen to countries. Um, they can make proactive choices, they can direct it to the parts of the NDC 
where it's most valuable, they can leverage the value of it, um, etc. So in that sense, you know, a, a big supporter of inten intentionality, if that's a word. Um, in terms of corresponding adjustments, just to wrap up on that, yes, we've got a well, we've got various public positions on uh, alignment with the Paris Agreement. I think the Article Six outcome of Glasgow allows the differentiation between authorised and adjusted units and those that haven't been adjusted. We were early proponents, I suppose, of the consideration that double claiming and offsetting don't play well together. So there is clearly a risk that if you have a double claimed carbon credit, you aren't necessarily any more certain that you yourself have offset. Um, we recognize also at the same time that you know, that's an emerging set of infrastructure and it's you know, not within the reach of every project to be able to do. So it's a, it's a, it's a high wire act to um, you know, bring that infrastructure through and realize the value of it while not throwing you know, often very vulnerable projects under the bus. So our, our public position remains as it is, and you know we we're trying to work with those frameworks and those 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 experts to bring forward those norms. Thank you, Owen. Let me move over to uh, to Derek. Derek, you've written extensively on on all of this and on accounting systems and the interaction between voluntary carbon markets and uh, Article Six. Um, what what uh, share us are your views and you know potential risks and opportunities here in terms of um, everything that we've said around corresponding adjustments and um, the, the interaction with Article 6. Derek. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pedro. Um, and, and, and thanks for the opportunity. It's great to be with uh, some familiar faces today. Um, and uh, apologies that I couldn't be uh, down there in person. Uh, it'd be great to, uh, to reconnect with uh, a wider community down there. So hopefully uh, next time. Um, you know, I, I guess just to reiterate a bit of what Owen was saying, uh, there's a tendency to think of voluntary and compliance markets as sort of operating in uh, parallel streams separately from each other. But I think there's been interactions, you know, going all the way back. Um, you know, if you want to look at the gold standards origins, right, they started out as a um, premium certification scheme for CDM credits. Um, and branched into the voluntary market uh, near and dear to my heart, of course, is the Climate Action Reserve um, and the California Climate Action Registry, which was an independent program initially serving the voluntary market, but established by the state of California. And of course, um, there, there was some feed into the regulatory program in California as well. Um, and then any number of examples springing up over the years where uh, you have regulatory uh, programs, carbon pricing programs of one sort or another, recognizing credits issued by some of these quote unquote voluntary standards, uh, whether it's South Africa or Mexico uh, or Corsia, for example, the CDM you know, sort of conversely, uh, you know, offering credits into the voluntary market, uh, serving demand for Corsia. Uh, and now we have, uh, I think, some explicit recognition under Article 6, um, you know, in particular with respect to the 6.4 mechanism, the successor um, to the CDM, uh, essentially uh, recognizing both, um, you know, compliance purposes, if you will, sort of trades between countries um, or the uh, option to authorize credits for use. Uh, you know, it's, the, the, of course, in international treaty language, it's other mitigation purposes, but uh, essentially for voluntary uh, use use cases. So increasingly what we're seeing is a, a convergence, I would say, um, and I think that's a good thing um, towards a, a, you know, a kind of single system, uh, you know, maybe with different segments, um, but where you know, the key distinction between voluntary and regulatory is really the demand for the credits, um, what is driving that demand. Um, so, you know, looking forward, I, you know, and, and just reiterating what Alexia was saying as well, um, you know, we, we need these markets, I think, working together um, and, uh, you know, toward, towards a common purpose, um, which is getting the world to net zero. Um, so it's incredibly important to harness, I think, this, this energy and demand in voluntary markets towards that end. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see going forward whether you know we see maybe some respective roles um, for for these different markets. I think one key distinction um, between 
you know, say the voluntary and uh, the regulatory segments is there's been a, I would say a larger emphasis in the voluntary space on nature-based solutions, agriculture, agriculture, forestry and land use, um, you know, more so than, than what we found in regulatory programs. And, um, and I know uh, a lot of, um, I guess, hope and anticipation that voluntary markets can help uh, greatly with avoided deforestation in tropical countries and things of that nature. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see that, you know, and I guess on the flip side, uh, you know, we have this proposal from uh, the United States, uh, in particular, this energy transition accelerator, which is kind of looking in the other direction uh, towards, uh, you know, energy sector investments. Um, and, you know, I, it, we'll see where that goes. Um, but I think uh, the idea there is really interesting, like creating uh, kind of large scale transformational kinds of investment vehicles into which maybe you might see voluntary demand uh, and possibly regulatory demand uh, going to, to drive those transformations. Um, so that's an interesting thing to look for going forward. I think coming back to this question um, of the authorizations, the accounting, um, I think it will be important uh, to see these markets align on a common accounting system. One of the big questions in the voluntary market today um, that still lacks some clarity is, you know, what is the difference? What is the difference between a credit that is backed by a corresponding adjustment and one that is not? Um, we have, uh, you know, some potential answers out there, and, and including within uh, now that. The, uh, the rules for the Article 6.4 mechanism, which is, you know, basically saying, like, look, you can have an authorized credit, um, or you can have a non-authorized credit, which is called a mitigation contribution emission reduction, uh, with the idea that those credits are essentially uh, assisting countries in achieving their NDCs. I think by implication, saying those are not offset credits, so it's kind of a different model for the market. Um, and this will be one of the big questions, I think, going forward, like what is the, the, the central model for voluntary markets? Um, you know, is it, is it offsetting? Is there a component that looks at mitigation contributions? What is the, um, uh, I guess, the pitch <laughs> for, for, what, uh, for a mitigation contribution model in a voluntary context, and, and will that have some traction um, but uh, th those are the questions that continue to be debated and I think need to be worked out. I'm hopeful, despite all the hurdles, that we'll see that worked out um, and maybe see both these models work working as viable mechanisms uh, going forward. Thank you, Derek. Uh, a lot to chew on. Um, Kelly, you have been, I was just uh, thinking about a, a, an event many years ago you and I shared where somebody came up to Christiana Figueres, uh, for those who don't know, uh, former executive secretary of the, the UN conference, and introduced herself as the mother of the Kyoto mechanisms. You, you know who I'm talking about, Kelly. Um, but I have to say, um, we're closer to the truth if we were to, uh, to say that Kelly was, to a certain extent, the mother of Article 6. She won't lay claim to that, but she was, in fact, chairing the, 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 the contact group on it for many years at, up, up, up until Glasgow. So um, assuming that as a fact, that you're the mother of <laughs> Article 6, how is the kid going? <laughs> and, um, and can you tell us about, you know, what's he planning to do? That's the first thing. And then you've been very much involved in uh, a couple of initiatives that, um, inspiring a couple of initiatives that a lot of us here are involved in, namely the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, uh, and then the uh, almost similar acronym, the very, uh, what is it, the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative. The first thing to, to ask you is, why are these named like that and have the same, <laughs> almost same acronym? Who's responsible for that? Um, given that the whole point was to you know, clear up uh, and not to have more confusion <laughs> in the market. But second is, what do you expect the role of this emerging regulation, if you want, or quasi-regulation, uh, onto some of these issues that we're discussing about? Kelly. Thanks, Pedro. Although I'm not sure I want to um, claim the ugly baby as it <laughs> as it might be. And, 
And I will also say that you were there and Alexia was there too. So <laughs> don't even, just don't even. <laughs> I remember Alexia, um, anyway, we could tell you war stories, but I think, think article um, 6.8 and 9 got written by Alexia or negotiated by Alexia at, at some 5 a.m. before the final day of Paris. Is that correct, Alexia? Um, I'm pleading the fifth on that one. That's right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry, guys. We go. Uh, the, in fact, all of us go way back. Um, so I want to unpack this just a little bit because I, I think there are interactions. And, and um, I think I would start by saying the fact that we're having this discussion and the fact that Article 6 decisions make reference, however hidden by cop speak <laughs> for those of us that can squint our eyes and read through that shows um, the sort of remarkable evolution of the voluntary carbon market. I can tell you that we, when we were in Paris negotiating Article 6, in the very wee hours of the morning, apologies for some of that language, um, the, the VCM wasn't really a significant consideration. Um, and, and in just a few short years, the fact that we're having this discussion and the fact that the Paris rule book for Article 6 um, includes reference to the VCM um, in a huge, <laughs> represents the success of the voluntary carbon market in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, with increased success comes increased scrutiny. That's, that's to be expected. Um, I agree with the and framing that Alexia and Owen and Derek have all put forward. We've already seen this um, in Corsia and California in a lot of the examples that have already been cited. Um, and so there is some convergence of these systems, but I just want to I just want to make a, a really important point that across most parameters, compliance and, and voluntary markets aren't really comparable. Um, the VCM has most definitely reached historic heights, but compliance markets like the EETS dwarf the VCM by volume, by value, um, and once a VCM credit is eligible in a compliance system, it's not really quote unquote voluntary anymore. It becomes a compliance mechanism. So just to be clear, the VCM can never replace the impact of well-designed legislation of a well-designed emissions trading system. It can't replace that impact in terms of coverage, in, in terms of um, emission reductions or removals. So I'm not sure it's, you know, asking whether these can coexist. I, I think they absolutely can and have to because they're they're not it's apples and oranges. Um, they're not substitutes. The purpose of a well-designed emissions trading system is to efficiently and hopefully significantly reduce the emissions of covered installations um, or provide them a, a more cost-effective way to reduce their, their emissions. Whereas the VCM, I think if we design it well, can offer a, a strong vehicle for private sector investment in reductions and removals outside of their own value chains, and in addition to those that they need to take to be on a science-aligned pathway. Um, I, I absolutely recognize the interaction, and this is an important discussion, um, but I just don't want it to be converged with substitution because we're not going to get to 1.5 degrees voluntarily. And, and I, any suggestion that we could is um, it's just not realistic. Um, but in terms of what we need to do to make the VCM as successful as it can as a vehicle to channel that um, private sector investment, um, we need to we need to work on integrity, and that's what um, Derek, Pedro, and Alexia are doing in the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Market, the ICVCM. <laughs> um, here's where we go into the alphabet soup, um, and we need to make sure that the use of, of carbon credits in a, for voluntary targets um, is not greenwashing. And that's really the focus of the efforts in the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, the VCMI. Um, I think that both initiatives <laughs> like the word integrity, and they were both about the VCM. So we had the VCMI and the ICVCM. <laughs> I don't know how else. I think maybe there was a little com competition about using the word integrity. Um, 
It's like define sustainable development before we had the SDGs. Define integrity. So um, it's just a it's just a buzzword. And so you have two that are very similarly named, but do do very different and complementary um, things. And they and they both really um, embrace those roles. On a more serious note, I think that it's clear that we need to make sure that voluntary and compliance action isn't double counted. And for some things, we have a very clear understanding of what that means. So you can't issue a voluntary credit where that where coverage of your mandatory emissions trading system would cover that installation, or you have to have something to address that double counting. That's really clear. I think that the question about corresponding adjustments is less clear, and I find myself to be in a, in a sort of a strange position. I think basically three or four people, and it may be people in this panel, occupy that middle ground position where we're really trying to figure out the right use. Um, corresponding adjustments tend to be something that people feel very strongly about and tend to be all the way on one side or all the way on another, and I'm I really would like to find a path through. The truth is um, most um, developing countries are not in a position to do corresponding adjustments for voluntary action right now, nor would they want to. Um, they don't even have the administrative structure set up. So saying that that has to be a requirement right now is would essentially kneecap the market because it just, we don't have those systems in place. I think those systems can be put in place. And I hear, um, when people call for there to be a distinction in terms of the use related to a, a corresponding adjustment being associated with a credit or not. Um, and I, I think that's something we should certainly explore. What I want to make sure, because lately what I've heard is that we should explore all sorts of different um, quality standards related to um, carbon credits when it comes to their use. I think we can explore it when it comes to accounting. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot of appetite for some of the, the uses that have been suggested, but one thing I know is that we can't reduce the other quality fundamentals based on use. So additionality, permanence, leakage. It, I don't think we should be holding those to a lesser standard depending on how they're used. Um, I think there are limited dollars available for this kind of investment and we have to make sure all of it is as impactful as possible. So just that's one thing that that concerns me about trying to distinguish these things by use is that I think folks are taking that notion, which was a notion designed for accounting and applying it to all sorts of other quality fundamentals. And that's something I want to make sure does not happen. Um, because yes, the use is different, but that certainly doesn't mean that the dollars are unlimited and that we should let some have less impact than others. Uh, so that's what I would say on that, but thanks very much for having me. And I'm sorry if I didn't unpack the alphabet soup well enough. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's fine. You, you did uh, towards the end um, address one of the, the questions I was uh, considering putting into the panel, but I'll, I'll put it anyway, which is, uh, and like you, I've, I've been around this for a while. So I've heard people say um, that let's say the, the offset use, to, to make it very simple, the offset use is the, the one use for which the highest quality um, standards should be uh, applied. And that somehow, if you're not using it for offsets, that there would be a kind of a lower threshold, in particular in relation to things like uh, the additionality of credits. So to put it in, in perspective, the idea is, if I am not claiming to uh, s offset my own emissions with the use of a carbon credit, then I can somehow relax a little bit about the potential additionality of the, the credit. So you know, maybe buy something that is you know, not uh, you know, squeaky clean in terms of uh, additionality. I wonder how others, Owen, Derek, and Alexia, how do you feel? I mean, do you agree with, with Kelly on this idea that there really is a single threshold of, of quality applied across different uses? So maybe, I don't know, starting with Derek and then Owen and Alexia to just to query on on that. Yeah, I, right. This is a um, a hot topic, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I understand where folks are coming from in arguing that if it's not an offset, maybe we can relax some of these criteria um, because in that case, you're not talking about this direct substitution effect, right? This sort of the classic model of offsetting is 
uh, I need to reduce emissions. It's costly for me to reduce my own emissions. I can pay someone else to do the same thing, um, you know, much more cost effectively. So uh, I can do that and count it as the same net effect to the atmosphere. Well, if you have low quality credits, that logic doesn't work. Um, but if that's not the premise, you could say, well, you know, I'm I'm going to reduce my own emissions in line with a science based target, for example. Um, so it's not this cost effectiveness criterion anymore. Um, I'm just making contributions to mitigation somewhere else in above and beyond what I'm doing uh, with my own emissions. Uh, and in that context, I can see the logic, but of course, one has to come back to the fact that this is a market. Every time you make an investment in mitigation somewhere, there's an opportunity cost in the sense that you could have invested in something else. Um, and so, you know, if if your investment dollars are going into mitigation that is uh, not additional um, or it's you know over quantified, um, you know, the baseline is wrong um, or may, you know, even not permanent. Right. Um, then uh, the, the question you have to ask is, well, could I have invested in something that was additional and not over quantified and was permanent? Uh, and so that that opportunity cost is always there. And so I think. I agree with Kelly. Uh, there still has to be a premium on uh, the, the quality uh, criteria and, and the integrity criteria uh, for any kind of credit, um, however it's framed. Can I can I just say that like so I hate being on a panel with Derek. He always says what I'm saying, but so much better than I said. <laughs> okay, Owen, over to you. Can you can you be more eloquent even than Derek? <laughs> <laughs> I be more eloquent than Derek. No Going to make mainly the same points. I think now. I, I think if you step back from it, the the as Derek said, there's been an evolution of purpose in voluntary carbon market from um, cost effectiveness to more explicitly taking responsibility for your emissions on the journey towards net zero as a company, right? And there's no logical um, imperative that the the way to take responsibility for those residual emissions is to offset. But to me, there is a logical imperative to say. If you're going to take responsibility for those residual emissions, you have to do it in such a way that wasn't already going to happen, something you were already doing. That doesn't make any sense. That's not responsibility. That's just the same thing you've always been doing. So I think, you know, the quality criteria in most cases transition quite nicely, I think. You know, you still want to demonstrate you've had an impact with good MRV. Non-additionality wouldn't make a lot of sense. You'd be straight into a greenwashing conversation. Um, assurance, or lack of assurance, you could just be making it up, right? Th those things aren't themselves directly attributable to the act of offsetting in the same way that offsetting isn't the de facto way to take responsibility, I suppose. I mean, there are those there are those two attributes that I think are kind of interesting to look at. Um, this not to reduce quality, just look at like, does it open up ways to be more effective? So I think one of those is the double claiming question um, and how these markets work together optimally and efficiently. And I think that question is more of, as Kelly pointed to, how do you optimize the use of these instruments rather than like have them compete with each other, which would be the bad outcome. And then the other one is permanence. So not to say that you can just suddenly have loads of impermanent stuff, but some of the gymnastics of permanence, you know, the constructs we built to support offsetting, you know, they are constructs, right? You know, we talk about, you know, hundred, I've seen people talk about 500 year permanence. Nobody can guarantee you 500 year permanence. It's just nonsense, right? So, you know, that is a construct that we can look at if we're not offsetting. That's not to say I'm advocating for impermanence. It's just to say, do we need these crazy gymnastics? Can we not come up with a better way that's based on risk and management and sustainable finance rather than, you know, crazy accounting gymnastics? Thank you. Uh, Alexia, um, on, on this, but also just reflecting on the state of the market, could you tell us a bit uh, as a, a former procurer of carbon credits, how big of an issue has this been, this uncertainty around corresponding adjustments, and how would you see it solved? Where, where would the solution, if anything, come from? Yeah, thanks, Pedro. You know, as I'm listening to us speak, um, when I was at Netflix, the, it was the first job I've ever had where I've worked with non-sustainability professionals, and we really need to simplify the way in which we talk about this stuff. Corporates care about one thing, the claim. That's what matters, because we have decided that we are solidly in a carrot world and not in a stick world, which means that corporations that are taking voluntary action are voluntarily taking on expenditures that they would not otherwise be required to make. 
And that is a really fundamental difference in a regulated versus unregulated market. And it took me a while to figure out why my European corporate counterparts were in such a different place when it came to the net zero transition. And it's because they're being regulated through this transition with a massive amount of subsidies. So the, the playing field is significantly more level for companies in other parts of the world than it is for the United States. And as we think about you know, just the, the enormous global market share that is represented by companies headquartered in the United States, um, the claim that the nonprofit community has sort of stepped in and allowed them to make um, is really what they care about. And it, it is already enormously difficult and complex to try and explain to people who barely understand what a greenhouse gas is, never mind the nuanced distinction between an offset and a contribution and a renewable energy certificate and how all of these things fit together and what you can say about this thing versus that thing, it needs to stop. Like We just have to make this easier for them. <laughs> I'm sorry. And the accuracy is really important. Um, we need, because there is only one ledger at the end of the day that matters, and that is that of the atmosphere. And so all of these systems that we're building around attribution, around who gets to claim what, around who's responsible for what, that's all an incredibly important part of mapping this transition. But we cannot get so mired in the detail that we lose sight of the ultimate ledger, which is the atmosphere. And everything that we build moving forward, whether it's in the voluntary system or in the compliance system, needs to be laser focused on drawing down as many emissions as possible, as quickly as possible, and to incentivize the fundamental business transition and change that's gonna be required in order to solve this problem. Um, and so I think the thing that's really changed, Derek, from that old framing of you're either mitigating or you're offsetting, that has actually really changed in the last five years. The conversation is not now, are you going to reduce your emissions internally or are you gonna buy offsets? It's you have a science-based target, you're expected to be demonstrating progress towards your science-based target across your covered scopes, which right now is mostly all three of them for many companies. Um, and that is a sub significant and substantial undertaking. But this notion that somehow you're not allowed to offset until you've achieved complete decarbonization across most of your value chain is frankly enormously counterproductive to solving the problem of climate change. And what we need to be doing is asking companies to both make steady progress towards their internal decarbonization targets and also to be investing in beyond value chain mitigation and investment in nature and doing all of the things that we need to be doing um, in order to slow and hopefully halt global climate change. So this, this question of how all these systems hang together and how we construct these systems um, really needs to improve. <laughs> and that's a big part of the work that we're doing is just how do you take all of this alphabet soup and turn it into something that can meaningfully inform business transition strategies for companies and recognize and reward the companies that are voluntarily taking on these commitments and taking action in an extremely difficult environment. Thank you, Alexi. Okay. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I, we're, uh, we have about 15 minutes, I think, for um, questions, and I, I don't want this to be just uh, us here on stage and on, on TV. Um, so I'd love to hear from the, the audience any questions. Um, I was an old uh, teacher, so I always told my students, there's never a stupid question. There's, uh, you, you may have a stupid answer, but um, there you go. So please. I'd love to hear from people who actually do these things in real life as opposed to you know, pontificate like myself. I, do I see any hands up? Just Craig. <laughs> Craig, go ahead. Alexia, thanks for those comments about simplicity. I don't know why we have made this as complicated as it is, and I'd like to pose a simplistic view of what we're facing here. For any company, anything beyond its fence line, i.e. scope one and scope two, 
is a carbon creditable activity. That includes scope three. If you think about it, there's a global marginal abatement cost curve out there that involves a wide range of reduction opportunities that companies consider. And there's any company's scope three emissions is simply a sliver of that. Now, whether you want to call something an offset or an inset or a mitigation activity or a redbird or a bluebird, it doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. Why don't we just keep it that simple recognize that from an integrity standpoint, we need to keep enforcing that you know, through you know, efforts like the ICVCM, and that should apply to everything beyond that fence line. And not even, you know, what is the reason we're even thinking about wasting time right now to think about new guidance for that sliver of that marginal abatement cost curve when we know how to do this. It's not that complicated, it's expensive, but in terms of cost effectiveness, if we overly restrict what a company can do, which is what that, that focus on scope three seems to be, a company's gonna invest less and accomplish less. So tell me what is wrong with that simplistic view of where we ought to be heading now? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm, I'm a tenter hook, so I'd love to, to, to answer, but I won't. Um, can I get some more questions from the panel? If not, I don't see any hands raised. Oh, I see there, sorry, in the back. And could you just present yourself? So hey, I'm uh, Daniel Melling with Sea Trees, a uh, nonprofit tracking carbon in forests. And my question is around avoided deforestation. I was reading the IPCC report and the, um, you know, among the mitigation opportunities, it's like you have wind, solar, avoided deforestation, and then the uh, kind of restoration and afforestation. And I'm just wondering to what extent you see the voluntary carbon market as uh, being able to address that challenge, of avoided deforestation, and uh, you know, what, what other policies, programs, and investments need to take place alongside the voluntary carbon market to drive that outcome. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Here in the middle. Thank you, I'm Andrea Tuttle. Uh, this morning I attended the breakfast discussion on how to, co how to counter all the negative media on offsets. And the point was made that many companies now don't even want to enter um, and take on an offset risk because they don't want the negative blowback. Um, and, and so we were trying to come up with, so how do we form an offense, or we're always on the defense, how can we form an offense to try to, uh, because we need every bit of action we can get. You get the question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and actually address that last one, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but just, because I've been around this and I've seen, um, I've seen very bad practice, even in the so-called compliance market, in the clean development mechanism. And um, every time that there's been such demonstration of bad practice, and there's people out there um, that would love to kill the clean development mechanism, and basically they have been successful, um, and they would love to potentially, you know, scale down what we're doing with the, with the voluntary carbon market. The typical stance that I've seen from market practitioners, and again, I'm not the market practitioner, I've just been kind of around this market for a while, uh, has been more than, than def defensive, at, at times it's been dismissive, as in saying, there's nothing really happening here. You know, like, like the typical uh, scene in, in uh, slap six talking, nothing to see here, move along. But if you dismiss, the, the criticism just comes getting bigger and bigger. So I think there is, uh, uh, at some point, we have to reckon ourselves that there, we, owe, we owe it to everybody else to say, to be frank about, there has been bad practice, but we are addressing it. In the end, that's what motivates people like myself in the Integrity Council, is to weed out that bad practice. Whether it's around non-additional credits or human rights uh, violations, and I, I've had my uh, gray hairs with some of those in the, in the clean development mechanism. 
we need first to own up to, to, to those failings and then say, yeah, but those are, that comes with human nature. We are humans. So whether it's the carbon market or other types of, of policies, there will always be some of these issues. Once we own up and we move, move to uh, improving the overall standards, then that's how we, we can do that. Whether we need that as a concerted effort from everybody in uh, different uh, positions or you know, just having that uh, as, a, as a, a behavioral pattern change, I think it's, 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 uh, it's a question. But I, I'm very much in the, in, in the field of uh, we need to have a different conversation about what we've done bad and how we can uh, improve. That's, I'll stop there. Um, we've had issues around uh, accounting, scope one, scope two, would that be enough? Why do we need to bother, in a way, with scope three? Uh, avoided uh, uh, deforestation, and then the, 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 the question around you know, the, the, the negative, addressing the negativity around this, this, this market. So perhaps start with uh, Alexia and then the, the running order. Alexia, do you want to address any of those? I'll be very brief. I mean, I think the carbon markets will continue to play an essential role in avoid addressing avoided deforestation, um, and I think can be a very powerful mechanism. It's just this business of projecting a counterfactual baseline into the future and then changing basically the course of that future and then trying to retroactively, you know, armchair analyst whether or not we got it right is inherently going to be a subjective and extremely difficult exercise always. Um, and so we need to continue to improve the methodologies that we use to, to do that assessment. But I think that, you know, there is, I don't, unfortunately, think there's a better way to do it, really, than the way that we've been doing it. So we need to take the learnings, continuously improve, apply them, and, and iterate progressively. Thank you. Uh, let's go over to uh, Owen. Do you want to address any of the, the issues on, on th that have been raised? Yeah, maybe on the on the simplicity point, I suppose. Um, I mean, I fully echo Alexia's points around the way we communicate this, um, and to some extent, there's a monster being created here because you know, if you think about an offset claim, what you're saying is you're not saying I, I'm, I'm likely to have offset. You're saying you did, right? And the underlying credit is a construct of probabilistic additionality, and as we just heard from Alexia and the question on deforestation, an estimate of avoidance. So. Really, what you should say is, I'm likely to have offset, right? That's the, that's the truth of, the, the, of a good credit. It's not actually that necessarily that you did, it's that you likely did. And so I agree with simplicity, but with simplicity, therefore, I think you need to meet that with, with simpler claims because claims of, of like, I have made this okay, I am carbon neutral, somebody in the public is going to be able to look at your strategy and say, yeah, but you didn't do this thing. And so, you know, your carbon neutral claim falls apart. And that is the challenge. That's the, the lack of simplicity, if you like really stems from the nature of the way the construct is being used. And so we really need to think about that, I think, in terms of, you know, we, it's essential companies take responsibility. We need to make the way that that is conveyed as simple and as gen genuine and authentic as possible so that it doesn't lead us to have to create super complex constructs to achieve what's being said. So, so to some extent, not entirely, it is the nature of offsetting that creates complexity, not the, the fact that we need companies to be responsible. I think just on scope three, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's like 75% of the world's emissions are associated in some way with the top 500 companies supply chains, right? So it's not a sliver we're talking about, we're talking about the, the keys to the universe really. And a lot of those activities are going to be non-additional. Um, they should be being done, but they're hard to trace, right? You don't know that they're your suppliers, and if you go and work with some random supplier and say, well, that's close enough to mine, somebody's gonna call you out for that. Um, so using an offset mechanism to do that is not gonna help you. So I do think we need to look at scope three and the mechanisms for it. I think there's a lot to learn from the voluntary carbon markets in the scope three, in how we approach scope three in terms of, you know, are we making a genuine difference? How do we track and allocate? But I'm, I'm not sure it's just as simple as saying, well, we've got the carbon markets, can't we just use that for scope three? And that won't reach all of scope three. Um, and you know, in other places, it'll be a super inefficient way of approaching scope three, I suspect, as well. Thanks, Owen. Derek, um, any comments on, on all of the three questions? Yeah, I, I guess a couple of them. I, I mean, first of all, I agree with everything Owen just said. Um, and I guess uh, going back to, you know, what Alexio is saying, um, you know, it's, yeah, how, did, how did we get here? 
Um, I, right, there's always been this kind of mantra, like, you know, you reduce your own emissions and then you offset what remains. Um, but there've been ongoing concerns for years and years that companies, for example, will sort of pay lip service to that, um, but just offset their emissions. And it, there's, there's an opportunity cost there in terms of not um, making the investments in decarbonizing their own operations or their supply chains. Um, uh, that, that need to happen if we're going to, you know, have a chance of hitting 1.5, you know, not going over 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees. Um, so, uh, you know, I, how we got here is responding to this concern, I think, validly, um, but the pendulum has swung pretty far, you know, to say, like, companies need to now achieve science-based targets, not just for their scope one and scope two, but also for their scope three. Um, and then on top of that, maybe, you know, contribute to whatever you want to call it, beyond value chain mitigation uh, or, you know, carbon offsetting. Um, that's a big ask. Um, and so, yeah, I, so let me first say I'm fully sympathetic with what Alexia is saying in terms of, um, you know, let's, let's maybe think of orienting things around, you know, what companies can do. Uh, if they maybe can't commit to a science-based target given the context in which they operate. Um, and that's, yeah, not to digress too much, but you know, going back to something Owen said about national intention um, and some intentionality, uh, I think there's more that governments could probably do to kind of give some direction to companies. Like here's mm -hmm. you know, uh, how you could uh, sort of beneficially contribute to what we're trying to get to um, in different contexts. Um, so I, I, that's maybe a, a, a utopian dream, but, um, but one can help. Um, yeah, I, so I, I can totally see the argument for simplicity. Um, on the other hand, yes, scope three is, is, is potentially a big segment and, um, it, there, there's that influence that companies have, um, and that sort of producer responsibility, uh, that, that, that I think plays a role as well. Um, but we do need practical solutions. Um, so I, I guess reiterating what Ellen just said there. On the avoided deforestation piece, yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, th this is maybe one of the big gaps in uh, international efforts to address climate change. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'd love to see a role for the voluntary market there. Going back to what Kelly was saying, the voluntary market just isn't that big, um, it's maybe not up to this challenge. And again, it would be nice to see some more sort of coordinated um, efforts. I mean, it's great to see what's been going on so far, um, notwithstanding the baseline questions Alexia referred to, but you know, we need to continue improvement there. Um, but again, I guess a hope, uh, an expression of hope that we can see uh, some more coordinated efforts where you see either it's compliance or, you know, policy mechanisms driving some of this, but where the voluntary market can feed into uh, to further those efforts, um, it, it'll be really crucial. Thank you, Derek. I'll uh, move over to Kelly. I'll give you the last word of, uh, of the panel because we're, we're coming to a, a close. Um, given your, your okay. role currently, um, I'd very much be interested in, in your views on the state of the, the negativity uh, question, put it this way. But anything yeah, else? Yeah, maybe I'll take that one. I'll take that one first and back into the other two. Um, yes, there's a lot of negativity. The, the thing that worries me the most, like I said, with increased success comes ex increased scrutiny. There will always be opposition to any market-based approach, and I don't mean just for climate. Um, you just see this. Mm -hmm. I think it's also, we're all victims of our own success. The thing is, there is so much information about um, carbon market mechanisms, be it CDM starting so long ago, um, that we're open to scrutiny because of some of the transparency. I know everybody says we have transparency issues, but I, I guarantee the carbon markets are a lot more transparent in a lot of ways than anything else in climate. Um, we publish all the methodologies, all the reports. It might not be easy to find all this information, but you can certainly find it, which is why there's so many studies. So some of that is just because of the transparency and because of the relative sophistication of this market. It's one of the things I find frustrating is like, we're applying a relatively simple, or sorry, um, sophisticated accounting system 
that has come from years of carbon market mechanisms and the CDM and how they interacted with compliance targets and the you know the birth starting with gold standard of of the voluntary carbon market out of the CDM and things like that. Um, and then we're applying it to these really unsophisticated voluntary targets. <laughs> so there is always this sort of weird mismatch. Um, I think everything is catching up. Uh, my biggest concern about that right now is two. One, the companies are afraid to do anything because they feel if they, they're safer doing nothing than they are doing something um, because it's like a tall poppy syndrome. If you do something in the voluntary carbon market or in an increasing number of areas of climate action, you're more likely to be shot down. And I think that's not being helped by reports that highlight the quality of action of companies that are doing something rather than highlighting companies that just aren't doing anything. And I think we do need to, as Derek mentioned, that pendulum needs to come back <laughs> to a reasonable place because that's a ridiculous place to be. I also think um, when it comes to like, can't we do this another way? I hear this a lot in, in these beyond value chain mitigation discussions which I think are important discussions, but at the same time, if you're going to have companies spending private sector dollars, which the IEA and everybody else says we need a lot more of to solve climate change, don't you want some fundamentals about that? Don't you want to know that, you know, what you're paying for wouldn't have happened anyway, or that it won't just be reversed by some sort of, you know, any kind of act of God or whatever it is in just a few years. And um, that, you know, you're not just investing in something green and next door is something brown of equal size opens up. Those are just fundamentals of carbon markets. Those are permanence, leakage, additionality in their most fundamental ways, if we want to make that simple. And it feels weird to me that we would reimagine and rebuild the entire thing instead of just improving on what we have. <laughs> if we think what we have is faulty, let's just make that better instead of trying to start all over again. Um, and so I think that's a lot of where we need to focus. It's just, it feels such a waste of time for anybody working on climate change to be so heavily invested in cancel culture. There's so much to do, so much to do. So I, I just, that it's frustrating to me because I think there's, there's better ways to spend one's time. Um, I do think that scope three is a really growing and really fascinating area. Um, and it is related to offsetting, and I think we're going to take a lot of this, the book and claim systems that will be necessary to reduce scope three emissions are, are going to draw heavily on that sophistication that I was talking about, the sophistication that we've grown from carbon markets. Um, and I hope we don't try and reinvent the wheel altogether, but I think that's a massive area, and, I, and exactly for the reason Owen has said, is that a lot of, in particular, um, North American and European companies' impact is really in their scope three emissions rather than in their scope one and two emissions. I think we have to be careful when we talk about it. That is not the case for companies in developing countries, for instance, or at least not always. Their impact is in their scope one and two, and their scope two is just a, a, an okay. unlucky grid situation. So <laughs> we just have to be careful about how we talk about these scopes and which companies we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so on avoided deforestation, I think it's probably the most important thing we need to do this decade. Um, it, it is literally game over if we don't um, protect tropical forests. We're, we've lost if at the end of this decade we haven't managed to do that. I think carbon markets have a role to play, but I think as Derek said, and I agree completely with what Alexi said, and as Derek said, carbon markets are not the panacea. They cannot answer the entire question. Um, we need a lot more of a lot more things. And I think the scope three work is going to be able to help on that. We are seeing legislation um, related to trades. You know, if we can if we can show that a company has an impact on forests and if we don't let their products be imported, that can be another huge lever. Um, but I do think carbon markets have a big role. I think it's 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 really important for things like revenue sharing with indigenous people in an indigenous territories where we see that they are actually more successful even than government government at protecting those lands. Those kind of things, carbon markets can be really directed and really impactful on when it comes to um, avoided deforestation. And circling back to the publicity point, if we just show more what that can do and the impacts that those things can have on the ground, we'll have a better 
publicity record, to be honest. So um, thank you so much for Pedro, your amazing moderation and just for being there. And thanks to everybody else too. Pedro, you, back to you. Thank you, uh, Kelly. We're, at, uh, we're a little bit over, over time, but I'd love to, first of all, uh, thank the, the panelists. This conversation around uh, the, the convergence, uh, the overlap of uh, compliance and voting markets doesn't stop here, obviously. There's a lot of uh, discussions going on, um, but uh, I would note that, at least among this panel, there's quite a lot of convergence of opinions on, on some of the, the key uh, parameters of the discussion. And that in itself is already quite, uh, quite interesting and, and motivating for myself. Uh, thank you all for, um, for joining here and uh, a round of applause to the speakers.